In the book of Acts of the New Testament, we read in chapter 2 how God poured out his Holy Spirit upon the Jewish community. In Acts chapter 8, we read about how the Samaritan community experienced the same outpouring of the Spirit. Now, in Acts chapters 10 and 11, we read about baptism of Gentiles in the Holy Spirit, that is, of non-Jews. We shall be reading from the New Revised Standard Version, updated edition of 2022, the newest Bible version in English. We have now come to section 4 of seven sections of the book of Acts. The Apostles' Witness to Gentiles, that is, to non-Jews. Text between square brackets reflects variant readings from ancient manuscripts of the 5th century or earlier. A plus sign indicates where manuscripts add text, a minus sign where they omit text, and a circumflex where they replace texts from earlier documents. To make better sense of this study, we cite these three biblical texts. In the words of John the Baptist, I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And then in the Gospels, Messiah Jesus himself walked through the temple declaring, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Now he said this about the Spirit, which believers in him were to receive. Thus, in 1 Corinthians 12.13, the Apostle Paul would later write, In the one Spirit we were all baptized into one body. Jews are Greeks, slaves are free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. That is, the promises made by both John the Baptist and by Messiah Jesus have now been fulfilled in the Christian community. This requires two theological definitions. First, there is baptism in, of, or with the Holy Spirit. By this we mean God has poured out his Spirit upon the major ethnic communities. Since then, every baptized Christian believer within those communities receives this Spirit. And then there is the filling with the Holy Spirit. By this, God enables Christians, through his Spirit, to obey Jesus' commandments and to speak on his behalf. So we come to Acts chapter 10. We shall present the account in ten steps. Step 1. The Lord sends a vision to a man of peace. According to various English translations, a man of peace, or a son of peace, or a person of peace, is any man or woman whom God has prepared to receive the gospel of Jesus and who will, in turn, share it with others. In Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion of the Italian cohort, as it was called. He was a devout man who feared God with all his household. He gave alms generously to the people and prayed constantly to God. One afternoon at about three o'clock, he had a vision in which he clearly saw an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius. He stared at him in terror and said, What is it, Lord? He answered, Your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. Now send men to Joppa for a certain Simon who is called Peter. He is lodging with Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the seaside. When the angel who spoke to him had left, he called two of his slaves and a devout soldier from the ranks of those who served him, and after telling them everything, he sent them to Joppa. 
Now, this Cornelius was a Gentile believer in Israel's God. He may or may not have converted to Judaism and may or may not have attended synagogue. In your Bible study groups, you might choose to discuss this query. Does God approve of the good works of those who are not yet born again, that is, not yet regenerated? See verse 35. Then compare Romans 2.14 with Romans 8.7-8. through 8. Step 2 of the account. At about noon the next day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went upon the roof to pray. We'll leave it to you to read the following verses from your own Bible. If you know the story, Peter saw various kinds of animals in a vision, and was ordered by God to slay and eat those animals, but he objected because they were classified in the Bible as unclean, unfit for human consumption. We're told here that Peter was in a trance. This term is used in the Septuagint of Adam in Genesis chapter 2 and of Abraham in Genesis chapter 15 to translate the Hebrew term tardema, which means a deep sleep. The voice from heaven said to Peter, That which God has made clean you must not call profane. Discuss in your Bible study groups what is it that God has made clean according to this story and the following text. Step 3. God arranges for them to meet. So the messengers sent by Cornelius arrive at the house asking for Simon called Peter. Peter received them and asked, I am the one you are looking for. What is the reason for your coming? And they explain what had happened to Cornelius. Peter and then invited them in and gave them lodging, even though they be Gentiles. According to Luke 10.6, Jesus instructed his followers to look for men of peace, that is, those who are culturally righteous, well spoken of by others, and hospitable. Sometimes they may come to you. So look for such folk. They are your door opener to entire communities. Step four, the man of peace gathers other folk. Next day, Peter got up and went with them, and some of the brothers and sisters from Joppa accompanied him. The following day, they came to Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. Upon Peter's arrival, Cornelius met him and, falling on his feet, worshipped him. Of course, Peter did not accept the worship, but we do learn something more about the man of peace. He is willing to gather his family and friends in his own home to hear about Jesus. Peter explained what God had revealed to him, that God has shown me that I should not call anyone profane or unclean, which is what many Jews called Gentiles. This calls for humility. We must accept invitations to come share in uncomfortable circumstances. Step 5. The Christian worker listens carefully. Cornelius explains how he had had his vision and how he had sent for Peter to come. Verse 33, Therefore I sent for you immediately, and you have been kind enough to come. So now all of us are here in the presence of God to listen to all that the Lord has commanded you to say. We learn more about a man of peace. He invites you to explain the good news, so do not forget to do so. If she or he refuses Christ afterwards, then he will be lost 
despite his good works. Step 6. The worker relates the good news about Jesus. Then Peter began to speak to them. I truly understand that God shows no partiality, but in every people, anyone who fears him and practices righteousness is acceptable to him. Partiality is to show preference for Jews over Gentiles. In some cultures, whites over blacks, or politically, rightists over leftists, economically, rich over poor, geographically, Westerners over Easterners. God shows no such partiality. Rather, there are men and women who are acceptable to God. Jesus used this term, translated accepted, by men. Elsewhere in the Greek Bible, it is used of persons or practices approved by God. Peter continued by relating the life and ministry of the Lord Jesus, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. Peace in the context relates primarily to relations between Jews and Gentiles. By calling Jesus Lord of all, he is asserting that Jesus is Lord for Gentiles as much as he is for Jews. He recalls how John baptized with water and made promises of baptism in the Holy Spirit. John may have been better known to Cornelius than was Jesus, even though John had only baptized Jews. He is Jesus of Nazareth, a common designation at that time for those who had a very common name such as Yeshua, Joshua, Jesus. By way of summary, from the above text, we can deduce Peter's doctrine about Jesus' life, that he was the Messiah, that he brought peace, that he is Lord of all, that God had anointed him with his Holy Spirit. Interestingly, the term anoint, krio, is the verbal form of the word Christ. Fifthly, Jesus did good by healing the oppressed. This is another instance of the Greek hendiades when two words or phrases are used for a singular idea. Jesus was definitely stronger than the devil, and that God was with him. He continues, We are witnesses to all that he did in Judea and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him on the third day and allowed him to appear. Not to all the people, but to us who were chosen by God as witnesses and who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. We can further deduce Peter's doctrine about Jesus' resurrection. First, the apostles were eyewitnesses to all that Jesus did. They were there when they crucified Jesus in public. God then raised him back to life from amongst the dead, and he appeared to many witnesses who knew him well. So Peter continues, He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one ordained by God as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him, that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. So we can now summarize Peter's doctrine about Jesus' authority. He had ordered them to testify by preaching. Again, an example of the Greek hendiades, using two phrases for a singular idea. God has made Jesus judge over the quick and the dead. And they Prophets who had come before Jesus testified about him in advance. 
Now God forgives the sins of those who believe in Jesus, and all of this comes through Jesus' name, that is, his person and authority. Step 7. Folk believe, receive the Spirit, and get baptized. While Peter was still speaking, the Holy Spirit came upon all who heard the word. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astounded that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even upon Gentiles. For they heard them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter said, Can anyone withhold the water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? So he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they invited him to stay for several days. We can underscore several points about this text. The Spirit fell, that is, he came from above, from God, and he came suddenly. They were listening to Peter speak, that is, literally in Greek, they were listening to his words. The term for word here is rhema. In verse 44, quite literally, are listening. Luke utilized a present tense verb to underscore that this was happening quite attentively. They were listening to the word or message. The term here is logos, that is, the content of the spoken words. Circumcised underscores the fact that those who had come with Peter were Jewish believers who knew and spoke Aramaic as their preferred language. Again, the Spirit is said to be poured out. This is an act of God. It is not merely their own emotional reaction. The same word heard here should be translated, we're hearing. Hearing what? The Jews were hearing these Gentiles speaking. Again, a Greek hendiadus, which we can translate it, extolling God in other languages, probably in Aramaic. This is how the Jews knew that they were praising God. We're told that Peter ordered them in the name of Jesus to be baptized. It's unclear from the Greek whether this, the phrase in the name of Christ goes with the verb ordered, ordered in the name of Christ, or goes with the verb to be baptized, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Moving into chapter 11, step 8, the Christian worker explains his reasons. When Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him, saying, Why did you go to uncircumcised men and eat with them? Some manuscripts here read you in the singular, others read you in the plural. It is hard to decide which was original. Then Peter began to explain it to them step by step. And he relates again the vision that he had seen and the lesson that he had learned, what God has made clean you must not call profane. This Christian worker, Peter, in step nine, explains his actions. At that very moment, three men sent to me from Caesarea arrived at my house. And so he explains again what had happened to Cornelius and why Peter entered his house. The angel that Cornelius had seen said to him, Send to Joppa and bring Simon, who is called Peter. He will give you a message by which you and your entire household will be saved. Entire household? Can families be converted at the same time? Compare Acts 16.31, which says, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. This is a phenomenon well attested in much of the world, where entire households and sometimes communities will become Christians altogether. So Peter continues, As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them just as it had upon us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, 
how he had said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave to them the same gift that he gave to us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could hinder God? Now when he said, the Spirit who came upon us, he was referring to the baptism of the Spirit for Jews, related in Acts chapter 2. At the beginning, the term here is arche, could possibly refer to Luke 24, 47, where Jesus said, Repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name amongst all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. The word of the Lord refers back to Acts chapter 1, verse 5, and the phrase to them and to us, underscoring that the Spirit is for Jews and for Gentiles alike. Point 10. Christian leaders learn new theology. When they heard this, they were silenced, and they praised God, saying, Ah, then God has given even to the Gentiles the repentance that leads to life. Repentance is a sign of the Spirit. The Spirit is not a sign of repentance. Repentance, then, is to stop disobeying God by putting faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. This repentance leads to life, that is, everlasting life, which includes a new life starting now, to rise from death at the resurrection when Jesus returns, and living forever in Jesus' coming kingdom. Let us try now to elucidate a doctrine of baptism in the Holy Spirit. First, eight biblical data or facts. 1. God has kept his promise to pour out his Spirit upon all flesh, that is, all ethnicities. 2. These ethnicities included Jews in chapter 2, Samaritans in chapter 8, Gentiles here in chapters 10 and 11, and later the disciples of John the Baptist in Acts chapter 19. All of these events happened to large gatherings, not to individuals. Fourthly, this happened to those who had come to faith in Jesus, either shortly before or at the present moment. Likewise, these always happened in the presence of one or more of Jesus' apostles, through whom God had promised the baptism of the Spirit. The tongues that folk spoke were likely real languages, for those present understood them as praise to God. Seventhly, there are no reports of such an event happening again, either in the New Testament or in early church history, even though missionaries today sometimes report similar spontaneous events where they preach the good news for the first time. Let's draw from this some implications and tentative applications. Firstly, we suggest that baptism in the Holy Spirit was for the first Christians in the first century. Secondly, ever since then, all who repent and come to faith in Jesus Christ receive the same Holy Spirit. Although, number three, speaking in tongues is not a necessary sign of receiving the Holy Spirit. Thus, we may promise to unbelievers that they will receive the Holy Spirit when they put their faith in Jesus. And then we ourselves can trust the Holy Spirit to do three things. Number one, he will convince pre-believers about the truth of the gospel. Secondly, he will regenerate new believers, causing them to be born again. And thirdly, he will come and dwell in all believers and in their midst. Sixthly, if you yourself speak in tongues, then thank God, but do not shame other Christians who may have different gifts from God. Seventhly, beware of those who preach baptism in the Holy Spirit 
as a way to recruit you into their church. And eighthly, Christians may be filled with the Holy Spirit whenever they need power to obey Jesus. Two concluding verses, Acts 5.32. We are witnesses to these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. The term has given could also be translated God gives, for this is a timeless aorist tense, equally applicable to us as it was to them. And then the command of Ephesians 5.18, Be filled with the Spirit as you sing. The tense here being an iterative present tense. Keep on being filled with the Spirit as often as you need. <laughs>